Hey everyone, welcome back to the Deep Woods Paranormal Podcast. My name is Matt Harvey. I am the founder and lead investigator of Deep Woods Paranormal. And I do a weekly podcast. Sometimes I do two podcasts in a week. This is actually the second podcast for this week. Uh, just because the demand for podcasts are going up, uh, people are saying, can you do a second one? Can you do a third one? Um, so we're going to try and do a couple of podcasts a week now just because we're getting so many subscribers and stuff like that and downloads and Thank you guys very much for that. We really appreciate that. And uh, thank you again for your support. Um, so uh, everybody's asked me a lot of questions about uh, what we're doing, what's going on, you know, when are we going after Bigfoot again? And what, you know, why haven't we done any Bigfoot research recently? Well, the, um, the truth and the answer is, the answer is we still are doing Bigfoot research. Um, we didn't have a shot in any videos recently. Uh, mainly because there's a migration going on with Bigfoots right now. They are moving around, following, basically following their food source, and the deer and everything are kind of moving because the seasons are changing, uh, in my belief. And this, these, these are all just my opinions, so uh, take them with a grain of salt. Um, always do your own research. Um, you know, these are just based off of my experiences, what I've seen, um, and what I've experienced out in the field, and what people have been basically telling me. I get, I think I've talked to people at least daily, uh, almost daily, about Bigfoot. Um, I had an experience on my property. I had, I saw one here. Go check this location out. Um, my friend saw it, you know, Bigfoot here 10 years ago or whatever. And, uh, you know, my friend's property is active. They, they seem to come on his property. I keep getting all kinds of information, which is awesome. Again, thank you so much uh, for everybody who is um, sending us information on Bigfoots in Texas here in our area. Um, so, oh yes, I'm sorry. Yes, I am rocking the big wood, the new uh, Deep Woods Paranormal um, hat. Uh, we just got this in. Um, again, this is one we're going to be giving away. Not this physical one. I'll send you a brand new one, I promise. But we're going to be... Um, uh, basically giving this away when we get to 300 subscribers on YouTube. So if you're watching this video, um, we'll be sending out uh, a really cool hat to some one lucky subscriber. When we get to 500 again, you know, I did a full, full podcast about this the other day, but uh, we'll be doing um, quite a few giveaways here in, in the future. So uh, we got a lot of new apparel in, uh, hats, shirts, t-shirts, um, Sweatshirts, uh, we have all different sizes, men's, women's, kids, um, I almost said juveniles, but, um, uh, you know, toddlers, stuff like that. Sorry, I got Bigfoot on the brain here. All right, so let's get back into the Bigfoot stuff. Um, somebody asked me, what's the largest footprint you've ever found? Uh, I found two. Uh, Try to cast the first one, as you can see. If you're watching this video, this is the remnants of a horn. Um, you can kind of make out the toes. I'm going to move my microphone. All right, so this was not the big toe. This was the second toe. You can see the other toe here, another toe here, and the another toe way over here. It's kind of splayed. And then this was the ball of the foot here. It just broke. It broke right here. This thing was massive. I think I measured it about eight inches wide, um, and then it was what do you think? Eighteen inches? I believe I believe we measured it to eighteen inches. Uh, so yeah, that's one of the bigger footprints I found. When we went up and researched at Joe's camp, we found one that was even bigger, uh, twenty-two inches, which was just I mean I have a size thirteen wide foot. I put it next to it, and my foot was almost a third um, as long as that. So if I put my foot down one in front of the foot, other in front of the other, um, basically that would have equaled the distance of this footprint. And it had to be at least, I think we measured it at 10 inches wide. It was huge. And so we got it on Joe's Camp. If you've watched our YouTube channel, um, if you go to Joe's camp, um, you'll see it on there. Joe's camp, again, ugh, we, we spent a year and a half up there just 
collecting data, and by data I mean possible evidence of Bigfoot activity. I mean, you just have to watch it for yourself. I mean, the video doesn't even do it justice. I mean, that place, Joe's Camp, is amazing. I mean, he literally has Bigfoots that come through his property night and day, any time of the day. You can stumble out of his, his camper, and there might be a Bigfoot uh, sitting there watching you. And I think Joe and I at least had two or three sightings while we were together where we could say that that couldn't be anything else but a Bigfoot. So, I mean, we had day sightings, we had night, you know, like dusk or night sightings. Um, again, <laughs> I've learned my lesson. Always have a video camera recording at every time you go out onto Joe's property. It doesn't matter if you're coming out of his camper, if you're just pulling up in the driveway, whatever. Always have a camera rolling because there's always going to be a chance to get a, a Bigfoot on video. Um, okay. So, um, speaking of Joe's camp, uh, somebody asked, are you going back to Joe's camp? And the answer is yes, we will be going back to Joe's camp. We are in negotiations with him on coming back out and trying to talk to him about um, how we can do it. Joe's camp, the, if you watch the YouTube video, you'll see all the, the huge, beautiful pine trees that go from, like, the bottom half of this property all the way to the back. There was like 300 of them, maybe not 300, but close to 300 pine trees um, that went from front to back and basically covered the middle of this property. This property is like a football field almost. Um, big property and essentially both sides, well, the one side, the landowner on the other side of, of his property on the right side cleared with his property of trees. There's no trees back until all the way, basically it goes all the way to the back where the little stream comes in. Um, Joe has multiple freshwater streams on his property, and he thinks that's one of the possibilities of why Bigfoot's come onto his property. But he also has deer, he has a lot of animals that come onto his property. Going through trail cams, I've gotten multiple pictures of deer, raccoons, possums, squirrels. I mean, squirrels the size of, like, cats. I mean, they're huge, the squirrels out there. I mean, I don't know. Um, probably because he's not hunting and beat him. But, um, yeah, it's just a lot of wildlife on his property. And then to his left, his cousin's property um, also is very, well, the front part is not overgrown, but the back part is. There's two abandoned structures out there that have basically are just in really bad decay. But that whole area hasn't been touched for 20 or 30 years. Nobody and nothing goes up into those areas. We're still trying to get permission to get up there. But once you go to the back of this property on the left where the cemetery is, where its family plot is, you can go across. And there's, and this might be part of the reason Joe has a lot of activity on this property. Um, the power lines go through there. So they've cleared it. And the last time we were up there, um, a friend of mine and I were up there, we found a really strange print. I mean, this thing was 18 inches long, but it more, looked more like a bird footprint than, you know, an actual Bigfoot. It was long and skinny, kind of like a, like a, almost like a heel up end, and then a long, narrow section. If you're watching the, the video, the video podcast, you'll be able to see what I'm kind of talking about. So it's a long, skinny section. On this end, where the heel should be, there was like a circle. And then it came up to almost, it almost looked like, maybe reptilian, and we'll get into <laughs> lizard man at a different time, but, um, and then it had three, almost like frog-like, um, like long toes, and then had these uh, circles at the end, you know, and, and then Joe's told me he's actually seen a wounded Bigfoot, or it broke its foot, and so I'm wondering if maybe this Bigfoot's walking weird on its foot, maybe it's walking on the side of its foot, um, and so maybe it's leaving a weird footprint. Um, but these truck, there was like three of them up there. And they were fresh. We had, it probably took off. Whatever it was took off um, right as we got there. So we're walking through in, in the brush. They had not cleared any of the brush up there. It was taller than me. I'm six foot three. And this brush was probably about eight, eight feet or so high. And right through the middle of it, going from Joe's property across to where the other woods are, there was a clearing. I mean, somebody had matted down 
all that brush. Wide, very wide, six feet wide maybe. Something had walked right through there. And it had been walking through there quite a bit. Because uh, basically it, it was just not, it was just completely crunched. I mean, it's flat to the ground. The, the vegetation was like like paper thin, matted to the ground. Like something had constantly been walking back through there. Like a lot of traffic had gone through there. And Joe told me, because we were looking over there, he's like, don't go into the other side of the forest. We don't have permission to be over there. Um, he's actually driven me up there and he's showing me around. And I was like, drooling. I'm like, Joe, can I get out? He's like, nope, we can't get out. This is not, you know, this is my present property. You can't get up there. So we've been trying to work with the cousin to try and get permission to get up there. And, and hopefully it's someday we'll be able to go up there because Joe thinks that's where they're at. Um, Joe actually lives in the forest. His family has owned big chunks of land since before the Civil War. Um, his family's owned this land. And some of it's been sold off. Some of it they still have. Um, different relatives and stuff like that. Cousins and aunts and uncles and stuff like that have big chunks of land in that area. Um, so, uh, essentially, you know, the, the problem with Joe's camp at this point is where the trees were in the middle of his property are all gone. So you have trees on one side, trees on the other, and then a bunch of trees in the very back. And the Bigfoot seem to be, it, it's so its so dark out there at night, you can't see your hand in front of your face. Something could walk within a couple, three or four feet of you, and if they didn't have anything reflective or a light on or whatever, you didn't have a light on, you wouldn't see them. You might hear them, but you wouldn't see them. So essentially, um, Joe thinks that they're, you know, at night, after dusk, when it gets dark, um, they're crossing across and then coming down the other side of his property because there is still some trees between he and his neighbor, uh, mainly on Joe's side. And the National Forest is right across the street from his property. And uh, an old member of our team saw a Bigfoot, an eight-foot Bigfoot, walk across the street there. You know, middle of the day. Just saw it walk across the street. And there's a lot of deer. There's freshwater springs over on that side as well. Um, someday we're going to have to get over there, and that's just what I was talking to Joe, Joe about last week. We got to get over there and take a look around, see what's over there, see if we can find any tree structures like on his property. Um, if you have not watched Joe's property, I mean, there's when we first got there, before they cut all the trees down, there was thousands of tree beds, like trees being bent over. Um, all different sizes, you know, trees being snapped. I mean, I'll never forget that night. Um, or I had two experiences on this property that same night. I It was pouring rain. And essentially, I was laying in the back of his camper on one of the bunks looking out. And I could see when the lightning flashed, I could see in between the trees. I could see up a little ways, maybe 30, 40 feet away. And I kid you not, this... The lightning flashes, and there's a day, it felt like it was like a minute long thing, but it was only probably a couple of seconds. Lightning flashes, and there's this thing standing there, and it's tall, hairy, and I can see the water like dripping off the fur. It was the coolest thing I think I've ever seen. I've, I've seen a lot of Bigfoots, but I've never seen anything like that. Um, another night, we had just come in from an investigation, and we just turned off again. Remember what I said and always have something recording at Joe's camp. Uh, we had just turned off the audio recorders, just turned off the handy cams, all that stuff. Trail cams are still out. But um, we were just, I think we were eating or something like that and going to bed. And it must have been around 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning. You hear this loud snap, crunch, boom. And everybody's like, holy crap, what the hell was that? <laughs> Something large was broken, and so we went out the next morning, and we found not just one. We found a tree that was probably about 12 feet tall. So the top of it had been completely, not just snapped off, like bent over and snapped. It was literally twisted and snapped over. Um, the wind, I don't think the wind did it, because there was no wind at that night. And, God, um... Yeah, and then we found a hole as we kept going up the up the way. 
it was a whole tree, like a tree that had about four or five inch diameter. It had just been pushed completely over. It was snapped completely at the base. So I don't know. I don't know if something was just set the wound there or whatever. Um, I feel like not only Joe has a really good uh, relationship with the Bigfoots that are on his property, but I think they like us too. We've never done anything to try and hurt them in any way, shape, or form. So, uh, and then Joe, sorry, I, I'm really bad at getting off and rambling, but uh, Joe, uh, he actually is part of our, kind of part of our team. He is, he has become a Bigfoot researcher himself, which is really cool. Um, and he actually goes out and he talks to witnesses. He has several friends that live up by his property that also have Bigfoot activity. Um, so we're working on trying to set up not only interviews with them, but also maybe a chance to get onto their property and do some Bigfoot research. Um, he has another friend that basically researches them too. And he doesn't really do it publicly, but he, he has a lot of information. So we're working on trying to get out and meet with him. I've actually talked to him on the phone. He's really interesting to talk to. Very, very, very smart guy. Um, so I'm looking forward to meeting with him, hopefully sometime in the future. Um, maybe not by the end of this year, but maybe the beginning of next. Um, so yeah, we're going to be continuing our research up by Joe's camp. Uh, I think I talked about this before, but I would like to set a tent up on his property, like a dummy tent or even just spend the night in it, maybe even go by myself or somebody else is brave enough to do it with me, set it up real close to where the woods are, um, right next to a tree structure or whatever. They still have, there's still hundreds of tree structures out there. They've created blinds, they bend the trees over, and then they stack like branches and stuff like that and brush up against the trees. So they could be standing there in the tree line, and you wouldn't see them. You wouldn't even know they're there. But, yeah, they're just, I think they're just extremely smart. I, I just do. I think they're wary of us, which is probably a good thing. And I think that they, you know, they're tolerant of us, but they, they just, you know, they're, they're smart enough to keep a distance uh, most of the time. Anyways, um, okay, uh, somebody was asking, what about the Sam Houston National Forest? Uh, well, right now... We are working with a couple of people who actually live in the Sam Houston National Forest. We're trying to help them collect some data. Um, we recently were able to get a stool sample from a gentleman. Um, I'm not going to mention any names unless they tell me I'm allowed to use their names. But um, so we're going to see what happens with that. We're trying to get it tested. Uh, we're trying to talk to, we're trying to do some research within uh, Texas A&M to see if they have somebody who will, excuse me, will um, test that for us. And then we're also working on um, trying to find anybody else who's willing to do it. So if you're watching this podcast, you live in Texas, um, anywhere around the College Station area, even if I have to drive to Houston, or um, I don't really want to drive to San Antonio, but I'll drive within a couple of three or four hours I'll, I'll probably drive out um and if you if can get the sample for us if you can go look, look at it uh up here on this rock this came from joe's camp if you're watching the video you'll you can see it on the back side of that there's a hair uh i would also it's tiny unfortunately it broke off when i put it in the bag i messed up i shouldn't have done that i would like to see if we can get that looked at too um below that this here is a sample, if you're watching the video podcast, there's an actual hair sample here that I collected from Orange County in California, um, up in the Santa Ana Mountains of, I don't know what it is. It could be coyote hair, it could be rabbit hair, or it could be a Bigfoot hair. I just, I don't know at this point in time. I found it right next to a Bigfoot print. So I'm just curious to see, get some of this extra natural expert's opinion on it and have them tell me yeah that's a really cool hair sample from a rabbit or, or a coyote or whatever or, you know i've never seen anything like that that hair is a little bit different i don't think we can test the DNA on that anymore uh, the it's just too old but um in the rock too um but this, this stool sample maybe we can get some kind of stool sample 
All right, so getting back to the Sam Houston National Forest. So they've got hunter, hunting going on right now. Um, the Bigfoots, I believe what they do is they follow hunters. I think that they go through and they wait till a hunter. They're, they're opp opportunist. Uh, I've, I've talked to several hunters down here in Texas. They've all told me the same thing. They're up in a deer stand. You know, they, they, they eyeball a deer X amount of feet away. 100 feet away, maybe that's too far, but quite a ways away. They shoot the deer. They go to set their gun down and start down the deer stand. And out of the woods comes this Bigfoot, runs the deer, and throws it over his shoulder and walks away with it. And, you know, these people, they, they have these scopes. They can see exactly what those are. I mean, they, they put polar scopes back up. They've never shot at one. Everybody's always told me, it looked too human like that. I just would not feel comfortable shooting one of these. Um, and again, that goes into the, do we kill one? I mean, we, to really prove a Bigfoot are real, I think you, there's going to be a lot of, uh, this is a whole another can of worms, but maybe we'll do a podcast on this. But if you kill one, you know, you're an animal. They're killing it. But then on the other side, you just proved that possibly Bigfoot's, you will know, you proved that Bigfoot existed. They can test it. And then we can get all kinds of information from it. I don't believe in killing the Bigfoots. I, I believe at some point in time, when we get comfortable enough and I have enough quality people helping me research these things, uh, we're building a network right now of Bigfoot researchers. Um, we'll actually build a network of all kinds of paranormal investigators, not just Bigfoot researchers. But once we get that network built, um, we'll be able to hopefully track an area where they're at because they do move. They will move with the food source like I was talking about earlier. Um, they will move, uh, and then essentially you just kind of have to follow their migration. Uh, I have some other theories on that that I'm not going to talk about because I don't really think anybody else has thought of this yet, or if they do have, they're not talking about it. But um, with hunters being in area, and if the Bigfoots are still in that area, I think they, they probably move away from there until they're actually hunting. And I think they what they do is they, they figure out where the hunters are, and, you know, they wait. They wait for the hunters to either, number one, go through and hunt for deer and kill one and maybe steal it. Or they wait for the hunters, they know, wait and tell the hunters, they know the hunters are out of the area. And so they hunt at night um, for deer. Or they basically aren't in that area. Maybe they leave that area um, and go somewhere else. Maybe they go to a different diet during hunting season. And yes, I do believe Bigfoots are smart enough to figure out when people are hunting, uh, especially for deer. Okay, um, so yeah, we will be getting back into the Sam Houston National Forest. We are starting to locate, we're starting to put a pattern together, let's put it that way. Um, I, I have a huge map with a bunch of pens on it where Bigfoot uh, reports have been sighted. Um, I use the BFRO. I use um, people from Facebook telling me where they've had experiences. Um, I also do research just basically scouting online. And then, of course, then we have uh, Amanda and my we're all, our own experiences. Um, when we've gone into the forest, we've checked out certain areas we were told to check out. And then, you know, we, we choose, okay, this is a good area. This isn't a good area. Let's, um, you know, let's let's move on from here. Or this is a good area. Let's stay here. Let's continue our research here. Um, and research, you know, we're out in the field. Men and I are out in the field every other weekend. Seems like doing some kind of paranormal research, be it ghost hunting, UFO research, um, Bigfoots or something else paranormal in nature. So, um, okay. Uh, yeah, we've definitely spoken to new Bigfoot, Bigfoot witnesses. Um, a friend of mine said he had an encounter down between the Texas and Louisiana border. Um, I pinned it and at some point in time, probably take a weekend, head down to that area because uh, there's a lot of other pins in that area and maybe start there um kind of it, the first thing we do when we go look for bigfoot we look for a water source okay so a water source around here um, is this area heavily populated if it is we need to find 
figure out if they're just crossing through this area um, as part of their migration or are they um, basically just coming into this area for a food source. What's going on? We need to figure out you know, who, what, the one, why, where. Um, and then we kind of pick um, from there. Okay, you know, we'll pick a small section and this is where we're going to go for that. And we're going to start here and we'll kind of do a grid pattern. We'll start here and we'll kind of work our way across. Um, okay, didn't have any activity here. Maybe they're not here. Let's move over just a little bit. Or maybe we heard a loud tree knock in the distance. So we'll kind of try and pinpoint where that came from and maybe try and move down further road and then hike into that area. Um, so juvenile Bigfoot research. Um, yes, we are still doing juvenile Bigfoot research. There's that one location. I'm not going to give up the location that we do a lot of Bigfoot research, juvenile Bigfoot research at. Um, now, I've had three or four sightings down in an area um, that I was told is a Bigfoot hotspot. It's kind of out in the middle of nowhere, um, right next to a little town. But it, it, it's like a, there's no, you know, people tell me, oh, there's no way there's Bigfoots there. Well, there's been a lot of sightings. Uh, if you're wondering what I'm doing in my left hand, I'm, I'm actually playing take. She's actually right here just below the microphone. Um, so um, essentially... We've talked to multiple witnesses. This area seems to be a, a paranormal hotspot, not just for Bigfoots, but UFOs and ghosts too. So I don't know why that all ties together, but everything I've ever learned about Bigfoots, every time I go out to do Bigfoot research, there seems to be, when they're, where they're at, seems to be also, the, also very paranormally charged with ghosts or shadow people or something else there's always some kind of other paranormal activity going on where there's bigfoots it seems like there's always seems to be some kind of ghostly activity why that is i don't know uh i don't know you know you've seen us in our, in our past videos on our investigations ask the ghost have you seen a bigfoot and the k2 will play all the way up so they supposedly they see each other you know and again like I said in the beginning, take all this of the grain of salt. This is just based off of our experiences. Um, so, yeah, we will continue with that. New locations, yes. I have had so many reports. We get, like I said, I talk to people almost daily about something paranormal. Um, have you checked out this location? You know, oh, I had a sighting here 20 years ago. Um, you should check this location out. The, the, the sightings are continuing to grow and grow and grow. And what we're looking for is we're looking for, uh, when I put the pins in, we're looking for at least five or six or more sightings, not necessarily recently, but in a clustered area. And then because this, this, those pins are within 20, 30, 40 miles from each other sometimes, um, even though they're close together, they're, they're still quite a ways away, and there might be a freeway in between them. There might be... Um, something else, you know, a cluster of homes now that are there. Um, so we have to kind of figure out, okay, what's there? Again, you, you know, it's the who, what, when, why, and where. Um, okay, so they're probably not in that cluster where the homes are, but there's a forested area right next to it, and there was just a recent sighting in that area. So that's kind of what we look for when we look for new locations. Um, our plan is for 2022. Um, again, we want to go with Joe. Uh, Joe is trying to get us into um, some other hot spots around his property. Um, we're being very careful um, because when he had the trees cut off of his property, uh, everything kind of stopped for a little while. And we were terrified. And he had no choice. He had bark beetles. If lightning had struck one of those trees, it would have burned his whole property out. I mean, he, all the, the, the whole area probably could have gone up. I mean, it would have just been his property. It would have been a whole lot of damage. So he's, he was being responsible, and he cut the trees down. Um, he left a lot of trees, but he cut down the ones that were the, the worst, and he's treating other ones. So, um, you know, no fault of his. I mean, we were, tr we were very concerned, and we still kind of are. But there's – he's – after the trees were cut down, he had no sightings for like two or three months. He had a lot of tree knocks. He had a lot of hooks thrown in his trailer. I mean, he hit, bounced off of his trailer. Rocks, pine cones, 
and mud, cl mud clusters um, thrown in this trailer. They were not happy at all. Um, in fact, I was up there about three months after, and there's a road that the mining company had used that goes from the front of this property to the back of this property. And again, Joe's property is like a football field. Um, the middle now is is pretty open. It's it's full of brush and stuff. It's it's overgrown with weeds and stuff. He does a good job keeping, you know, everything kind of mowed. But he's got a huge property. So um, that said, um, he he had we had, you know when I went back up there, we found more trees bent over. The ones that were left, a lot of them got bent over. Uh, more blinds have a lot of lines along the side of his property, the left side of his property, where not right next to where the road is, right next to where the power lines come through. Um, so if you're a Bigfoot researcher, you're going, okay, power lines, there's a road next to the power lines with forest in between, and then there's a forest, a small section of forest, like a line of trees, um, and then Joe's property. So I mean, it all makes sense. They come in there for fresh water because um, he's got, like I said, he's got the three fresh water uh, reservoirs. I mean, uh, three rush, fresh water streams that come through his property. That water is crystal clear. I, mean, I was shocked. And so, anyways, and then I think they're crossing across his property to go across the street and uh, go to the National Forest. But, um, you know, we definitely plan on going back up there, like I said before. Um, I think we're going to hopefully meet with some more witnesses up in this area. He's really trying to set up a lot of witnesses for us. And then um, I think we're going to be going back to a couple other locations, definitely going back to the San Houston National Forest uh, to continue our research down there and stuff like that. How many Bigfoots have I seen? God, 40, 40 plus. I, I've lost track, to be honest with you. I, I, you know, since I had that first sighting, um, I really, when I researched up in the San Juan Mountains out in Orange County, California, and everyone goes, oh, Matt, there's not Bigfoots up there. Right. Now, how much research have you done up there? None. How many you know, times have you gone out there in the middle of the night? None. <laughs> it's like, well, how can you tell me that you haven't had, you know, I haven't had any sightings when you've never been up there and you've never done any research up there? Well, it's just not possible. Sure. Yeah. So again, know your location. You know, I started looking at all the Bigfoot reports in California and the pens. I started painting out every single one from Laguna Beach all the way out past Riverside. There's thousands of, well, not thousands, hundreds of reports of Bigfoot sightings. And as man encroached and built in Orange County and stuff like that, they, they moved back up into the protected area and stuff like that. So, um, you know, the more, after that first sighting, like I said, I started doing research. I figured out their patterns up there. I figured out how they were moving around. And as I did, I think they, I think they had been watching me for a long time. It was like eight years before I had my first sighting up there. Um, my true sighting, where I could actually say that wasn't anything but a big foot. But I had things happen before then. Um, the tree knock that was right next to us to sound like gunshots. Um, not just gunshots, but like a shotgun had gone off right next to us, like feet from us. Um, that eight plus foot, Bigfoot three stepping the road. We just thought it was a shadow person, a 13, 14 foot shadow person. Um, the rocks being thrown at us. Um, the distance screams that we were hearing. We, we didn't understand what they were. Um, I, I didn't attribute any of that to Bigfoot at that point in time. I just thought it was, I didn't know. I just explained it away. Um, so, again, you know, it's amazing how once you have a sighting, it, you're just hooked. And the more I research, the more questions I have. It just, it just it's, it's addicting. Um, so, um, like I said, I, I was very lucky to basically, I, I figured out their patterns, so I kind of knew where they were, and I continually had sightings of them, um, mainly because I think they didn't feel threatened by me. And essentially, I think the more they saw me, the more I was up there by myself in the middle of the night, two or three o'clock in the morning, the more 
they felt comfortable with me the more they didn't care if I saw them or not because I wasn't hurting them in any way or, or disrupting anything they were doing. I was just studying them and I was also doing like rock clips and tree knocks and all that stuff and uh, you know doing calls and whatever else so I think they just you know they just grew to accept me. I was kind of part of their their, their group until I crossed the line and I left the drop cam in a place I'm not going to disclose and caught two possible Bigfoot juveniles on, on trap camera two consecutive days around the same time. Uh, just verifies to me that, that I, I had figured out their pattern. Um, okay, so tree knocks. People are asking, what are tree knocks and what do they mean? Tree knocks, um, in my opinion, and again, this is just my opinion and my experiences, it seems almost like one tree knock is, where are you? It, it's kind of like, hey, I'm looking for you. Um, knock back, let me know where you're at. Two tree knocks um, seems like, um, I don't know, it just seems like they're maybe they're, they're trying to warn uh, another Bigfoot that they're close. And three tree knocks seems to be on coming your way. Um, and again, these are just in my experiences. When we've heard three tree knocks, we usually have a sighting of some sort. They come down to an area where we can see them. Um, usually when you hear one tree knock, and this has happened multiple times, you hear one tree knock to your left, and then it's almost like they make a triangle. And you hear one to your right. And they're not super close. They're maybe 20, 30, 40 feet away or more. They could be distant. And then you hear one, you know, straight ahead uh, from, from where you're standing. And then you might hear one behind you, too. So it's kind of like, um, I'm over here, I'm over here, I'm over there, I'm over behind you. And um, so, you know, we used to do that. We used to do a couple of tree knocks. Um, whenever I would do, like, three real hard tree knocks, they would come into our area. They would come down. Um, and they, they didn't seem to like it when I did three. So I stopped doing three, but mainly at Joe's camp. I mean, man, they would get agitated. Uh, you, they would literally come down, which was cool because we were documenting them. But they would literally come down and, and take a look at you to see what the hell you were doing and then walk away. You could, you could, you could literally see their eyes blinking on the cameras. Um, again, watch Joe's camp. Okay. Um, can Bigfoots mock other animals? Again, just my opinion. Take the super of salt. You really should go have your own experience if you're really into Bigfoot. Um, if you're in our area, I'm always looking for Bigfoot uh, people um, either to help um, set them up and get them going and try and help them establish their own Bigfoot research or join us You know, when we go out on investigations. Um, so can Bigfoot mock other animals? I, I do believe so. Uh, this video is getting a little this uh, video is getting a little long, but um, I do believe that they can mock other things. Uh, I think the bird you hear when we went to the Sam Houston National Forest, that bird was a mile away. And I talked to a friend of mine, and he, you know, figured out what the bird was. But I've never heard of a bird following anybody. And these birds, they they fly from like tree to tree. And essentially, they, they tree to tree or they stay on the ground because they just basically hunt for uh, insects at night. They're nocturnal. And they do make a call. And so we essentially contributed that to uh, a Bigfoot mocking something. But it kept, they started a mile away. And as soon as I did a Bigfoot call, it was a series of events happened. So I did a big it, I did a big foot call. This distant bird call came out, and then a few minutes later it was a little closer, and a few minutes later it was a little closer, and it continued all the way to the point where we heard it really really close to us, and then in between those two roads we were along the pipeline, so it was like a almost like a cross. If you're watching the video, you can see it like this. So this is the big foot pipeline. Um, look, we were looking straight down the Bigfoot pipeline, and then there was a road that crossed the Bigfoot pipeline in the forest. Um, 
So we were kind of exposed. We were standing out on the road. Um, we had some trees in the background. And if you watch the, uh, the video, you'll see, I mean, that's not eye shining. That's like pupils. Something literally with pupils walks behind us. I even slowed the video down so you can see it. I stopped the video when I was watching it, and I was like, what in the heck? You know, I don't, I mean, they're like, people's like ours, but they're wider, much wider out, and it's only about my height. So um, I know it wasn't a person. I mean, I know for sure that it wasn't a person. There was nobody else there uh, except for the other group, and they were, you know, a half a mile away or a quarter of a mile away, whatever they were. Um, we would have heard them if they came walking down the road or came around. Um, so, um, something walks out as we're hearing these calls, we hear it across the way to our left and on the, on the right side of the road, as you're driving up the road, um, and then to the left of the pipeline, um, where the pipeline is. And we hear this, you know, that bird call. And then essentially I see something walk out of the brush. And as soon as it sees me, it like darts back in. So soon after that is when we had the eye shine, not the eye shine, the eyes um, from whatever that was appear behind us. But that bird call continued. Um, and as we moved, it moved. So we went back to camp, we started a fire. And essentially, as we were sitting there, this thing kept going and going and going and going. It was weird. It was kind of like it was just alerting something else to our presence. Hey, they're over here. They're over here. And at the same time, we had that encounter where I saw something walk out of the brush, and it was just a black silhouette. I mean, I saw. I think I saw some eye shine, but I mean, I couldn't tell you it's a Bigfoot or a person or whatever it was. If something walks out of the brush, and it, and it was a silhouette of a upright individual, and then so. They also had an experience where a Bigfoot had come in and basically on its tummy and the guy said he had seen it and basically stood up and turned and walked away. So that was really cool. That was his first experience, um, not experience, but first sighting of a Bigfoot. All right, guys. So this has become a very long podcast. I apologize for the, the length of this podcast, but uh, Bigfoot's, they're just, I mean, I'm just scratching the surface with Bigfoots and the reports and all that stuff. Um, just a lot, a lot, a lot to talk about with them. Um, as we continue to have experiences, we'll, we'll share those with you guys. And uh, please go over to our YouTube channel, Deepwoods Paranormal, and uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel too. Because this, this video, if you're not watching the video, if you're just listening to the podcast, um, this video will be over there for you guys to watch as well. Uh, along with our other stuff. Um, so thank you guys for listening. We really appreciate it. Um, you guys have a uh, good rest of your day, and we'll talk to you soon.